Hello, welcome back to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we're talking to another remarkable author uh, today. Um, we're speaking to Lissa Evans. Uh, Lissa seems to be living um, probably a dozen lives, actually. She's uh, a qualified doctor. She was a stand-up comedian, uh, a TV producer and director. Uh, she even won a BAFTA for her work on Father Ted. Uh, she's now an author and she's written uh, Crooked Heart, uh, Old Baggage, and uh, most recently she's written V for Victory. Uh, it's her new book. Uh, now she's in conversation with Jamie Fury. Uh, thank you, Ben, and thanks everyone for coming back to the Our Bookshop YouTube channel. Today we are joined by Lissa Evans, who is the author of uh, numerous books. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about today mostly is V for Victory, which has just been recently published. Uh, Lissa is also the author of um, Old Baggage, Crooked Heart, their finest hour and a half and uh, some novels for children and some, some other books. We're going to be focusing on this one today. Um, I've just been reading this book and just to set the stall for anyone that's watching this, I'm a huge fan of these novels. It's one of my favourite series of books that have been published in, in recent years. On the back cover, the Sunday Times calls it utterly wonderful and intelligent, which I think is, is absolutely accurate. And yeah, I've been reading this this week and loving every single page and it's one of those books that uh, I always go for as soon as, as soon as I see them released. So I'm, I'm really grateful to be talking to Lissa about it. Thank you. Thank you. So probably the best way to kick off is if you want to just tell us a little about, bit about V for Victory and um, I suppose where it fits in with Crooked Heart and Old Baggage for anyone who's, who's read those books as well. Right. V for Victory is, it can be read as a standalone book, um, but I think probably a reader will get more even more from it if they read the other two books in the series as well. But V for Victory is set in 1944-45 in North London and it's about the inhabitants of a boarding house and it's about the end of the war and it's about what the end of the war means to various people and, and according to who I'm writing about it can mean the return of a husband that hasn't been seen for five years, it can mean the end of a job that's that's been important, it can be discovery of, of somebody who's been concealing their identity and or it could be a new start in life. Um, I, I wrote a book called Crooked Heart um, a few years back which is set in 1939 it, it which is basically if I, if I gave it a strap line it would be paper moon set during the blitz it's about a, an oddball um, orphan evacuee who ends up in a sort of grifter's household in, in St Albans and ends up running a sort of a door-to-door -door fake charity scam with a woman who um, takes him in. And they eventually become a sort of mother and son. And after, when I wrote that, the, the prologue of that book has got um, the little boy, Noel, he's nine at the beginning, uh, growing up on the edge of Hampstead Heath with his godmother, who is a former suffragette. And I finished that book and I wanted to explore more about this former suffragette called Matty, who's a huge figure, huge dominant figure who even though she's dead for most of Crooked Heart still dominates the, the little boy Noel's thoughts and has some tremendous influence so I went back and I wrote about her in 1928 about former suffragettes and then I moved forward to 1944 so the same characters Noel the evacuee now 14 his, his um, guardian V the, the former scammer who is now nearly 40 and um, the influence of Matty is still inherent in that book as well. Gosh, that makes it sound very, very serious. But they, they are funny books, I hope. Um, yeah. And, and, um, and yeah, it was a real privilege for me to follow a, one character through three books. That's, that's a joy. You don't often get a, a privilege like that. As a they, are, they are tremendously funny. I even put a little, I don't often do this with books, but hey. I markers in, because there was a bit that just made me laugh so much. And they think it was... It was talking about the, uh, it was um, Winnie. Oh, the, yeah. uh, Winnie is the air raid warden. She's 20, yeah. 26 year old. We meet her actually in old baggage as a, as a 10 year old. Um, but in this one, yeah, she's 26. Yes, go on. And it was the Romeo and Juliet scene uh, where she was, oh, where she <laughs> met her <laughs> husband. And I, I, I'm, I'm often one of those people who kind of titters at books, but that actually had me roaring laughing. Oh, oh great. Quite, quite an achievement, I think, you know. They're, 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 oh, that's always the nicest comment I can get from someone if, if, if something in the book made them laugh. I love it, did, it did really make me laugh. Um, so what would be interesting to know is why this time period? Obviously, 
um, World War II suffragette movement and the, the beginning and the end of the war have an enduring significance, but what was it initially attracted you to the period when you first started writing? Um, this goes right back to when I was about 13 and uh, my big sister bought my dad a book for Christmas called How We Lived Then, which was um, probably the first time that a whole load of memories of the home front have been collected together sort of mass observation memories and people's diaries and recollections of the detail of everyday life during the home front and my dad said why do I need to read this I lived through it I mean you don't have to be an adult during the war but I took that book and I read it and I reread it and I reread it and I absolutely loved it it's not um it's not a, a, a sociological book a lot of uh, uh books about the home front later on obviously were far more broad in their analysis and, 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 and were more in depth but but how we lived then is about the detail of every day that really appealed to me as a child and adolescent and I read it so much and and it infused my world so much it's almost as if I've got memories of the second world war myself it was you know what what did kids find in their stockings where did people go on holiday what did they feed their pets what you know this kind of background it's like putting in the background of a jigsaw so that I was always interested in that. So when later on, I, wa I wanted to write a book about behind the scenes in telly, which I've been working in. And then I thought, oh, that's not so very interesting. Who cares about behind the scenes in telly? But I knew about filming. And I also knew that when you are filming anything, it feels tremendously important. And I wondered whether it felt that tremendously important when bombs were actually dropping outside. And I ended up writing a book that combined those two, something I knew about really well and something that always fascinated me. And it was about the making of a film during World War II. And that um, involved tons of research. It's called Their Fine Sound and Half. And when I finished that book, I was still living in World War II, if you like. And, and the idea for Crooked Heart came along. So it's, it, it's something that I know a lot about, probably in quite a superficial way. I'm not a historian at all, but I do... I've read about it so much that I do feel that when I look through my character's eyes, I'm seeing th that era. I, I, I'm quite confident that I'm, I'm seeing what they're seeing. And so that was, Crooked Heart was set during the Blitz. And then following up, I started to read about the end of the war because I was very scrupulous about my research. And I never wanted to know more than my characters. So that when I was researching the beginning of the war, I didn't read any diaries or anything set in 1942 or afterwards. I wanted the intensity of that moment. So when I started reading about the end of the war, even though I'd known a bit about it, I, there were lots of aspects of it that surprised me. And that particular last winter of the war in, in, in London was awful, awful. There were, there, there were first of all, there were doodle bugs in the, in the summer of 44, which were um, pilotless planes that were, that were sent over from various parts of Europe. And then at a certain point, their engines were cut out and they'd fall. And this book begins just at the end of the Doodlebug era and when what was called the V2s um, started, which were rockets. So basically rockets that were fired into the air, you didn't hear them, and they came down and killed people. And literally, you did not know they dropped, they were dropping. You just knew, knew they dropped. And if you'd heard it, you are probably still alive. Um, you know, they killed a lot of people who never heard them coming. So it was literally sudden death dropping out of the sky. And there were so many of them. There were so many of them. And, and there, were, there were, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten more B2s dropping every single day in various parts of London. And each of them would knock the roofs off a quarter of a mile of houses and kill a varying number of people. They might get lucky and fall in a park. They might fall on a market, as one awful one did in South London, and kill 117 people in a second. So against this background, they knew that the people knew the end of the war was coming. They knew they knew the Allies were going to win. But meanwhile, there was there was death everywhere. There was just awful rationing. I mean, people were so bored of the food, so bored, so miserable. And also, it was the coldest winter in living memory. So these three things, people were just grinding along, waiting for the end of the war, which never seemed to come. And I, I was completely fascinated by that. And I used that as the background for the the whole piece and people yeah people wonder why why Churchill was voted out at the end of the war well people wanted change they desperately wanted change they did the soldiers didn't want to come back and carry on with this uh, a, a, a country with no housing uh, you know uh, desperately struggling to right itself again they wanted change 
That's really interesting because I, I, I think one of the things that resonates about these books that I particularly enjoy is that they're about this incredible period of history, but they deal with the domestic and the ordinary lives of people going about their business. I think through that you get these really endearing, I, what I really love, what I really enjoy about V in particular, and I suppose Matty as well, is they're in many ways deeply flawed, but also yeah. very, very funny, very interesting, and very real for, for all of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I love writing V. V, and it's funny, I've seen some very nice comments about the book, and, and but it always like, slightly throws me when people say, V's a very good woman. I think, she's not really. She she tries, but I mean, V has, has spent a lot of her life slightly on the wrong side of the law, and it's really only on the right side of the law out of expediency rather than any innate goodness. Yeah. And and I'm so, fo I'm so fond of her. She was such a pleasure to write, and I've never written anybody quite like her. I think when I first wrote my first books, every single character was a bit me. You know, you know, when you start off, they're all aspects of you, because that's the easiest way to write a character to take mm. an aspect of yourself. And I think now I've written a lot of books, I'm able just to venture outside that and write characters that aren't me. V isn't me at all, but so I'm able to to love her in a way that perhaps I hadn't loved some of my earlier characters. Yeah, she's very endearing. I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the research uh, aspect of it because these books feel very genuine. Um, and to my uh, my grandmother, uh, she passed away this year at 95, so she lived oh, through wow. this period. And I, I bought her these books because she was super critical of anything that was not a specific rep. Yeah. And she also lived in North London and Watford and St Albans, so really relevant to, to the areas you, you talk about. I always bought her these books because she wouldn't criticise the detail. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful to hear. Well, I, I, was, I was scrupulous about it, particularly with their fine star and a half, which was the yeah. first book about the Second World War. And I, I'm research and research and research, and I would write down tiny details. I would write, I'd have file for vocabulary. I didn't want to have everybody talking, you know, in an old fashioned way. But on the other hand, you wanted to know how people refer to things, what, what odd words they use, what shorthand they use. And, and also, um, when, when it's, the most marvellous thing in research is when you stumble across something which everybody knew at the time, but which has been forgotten since. And when I was reading about the Blitz, there were, there were a couple of points that kept coming up in diaries, in novels written or published at the time, in accounts by fire people or, 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 or by wardens, things like the noise, the noise the day after a bomb, what you would hear that was the sound of glass being swept up. That was, that, that was, the, that was the song of London after the day after a, a bombing. But also when the bombers came across, and we all think we know what bomber engines sound like, but I kept on coming across accounts of people saying it was a stuttering, a stammering noise, a hesitating noise. And, and I read that, that, that actually the bomber engines were phrases unsync the word is unsynchronized I don't even know what it means but it means that it's not an even sound and bombers made the sound doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. and that was the sinister stuttering noise of them coming we, we don't know that and yet everybody refers to it and in fact um Graham Greene in a book published during the war um Ministry of Fear not a terribly good book but a fantastic account of raid in it he's got the bombers coming from the estuary and they're saying where are you where are you where are you? And I thought, oh, that's absolutely incredible. So having a detail like that means you are suddenly there with the people. You are hearing what people then heard. And once you're in that mindset, everything becomes a little easier about the book because the plotting comes out of what your characters see, not what I'm imposing on them. And, and, and the observation comes out what they would observe. Because when you're writing historical fiction, you don't want your people to observe what they wouldn't have observed you know she 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 uh clicked the, ba the bait light switch or whatever you know nobody thinks that but when stuff is new in war then they are describing it and they are visualizing it and that's what's so um interesting about writing about something like the second world mm. war because everything is new to people and 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 the, the, the vocabulary in the way of observation becomes part of its specific time and that's why I find it actually more difficult writing about 1928, where it's just a year. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's not a mass experience, 1928. The Blitz, that's a mass experience. You have a mass of people seeing the same things, saying new things at the same time. 
Yeah, that's, it's really interesting you talk about vocabulary because one of the things I was I was thinking about when preparing the questions for this is, is the dialogue in the book, which seems, I just feel it never lapses into that kind of core blimey governor. Oh, God, 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 God. The war that could be yeah. so easily just like a parody of it, but it feels very, very authentic to the way people would have spoken. And you, did you say you use diaries for that? Or um, where would I get dialogue from? Um, I, I, I read a whole range of things. So I, I certainly read diaries. Yes. Um, but also I would get a lot of information in newspapers. I love local newspapers at the time. That's really, really interesting. I, I obviously watch films, but film dialogue is slightly different. Uh, reported speech is very good. There were, there were books that came out um, that were written and published during the war. I mentioned before there were books that were accounts by air raid wardens <clears throat> of the Blitz or by members of the fire service. And those are fantastic because they are complete snapshots written in in 1941 came out in 1942 and I know that everything in that book is right and those those are gold dust to me and I would particularly take note of how people talked in those books and 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 what vocabulary they used and what observations they made and yes stuff stuff written and published at the time for me is the most the most vital mm. and, and and that's what I use but also dialogue for me I mean you know I, I started off in radio mm. so dialogue for me is is everything you know it's it's it and and also i don't i don't ever want ever want a reader to think oh they wouldn't say that oh i don't believe that i you know dialogue for me isn't exposition it's it's character exposition i can do in in the narrative in the narrative but dialogue has, is, is is character and action yeah no it's, it comes across that way so it's, it's, I've, I've always found it really like funny authentic also quite kind of oh. I say true, but I was obviously not around at the time, but you know, I just <laughs> 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 I could only hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um so in terms of the series, so anyone coming to these books new, um it's not particularly kind of it's not a linear series, really, is it? Because Crooked Heart starts and then we go back in time, but it's more the characters that sustain the series. The characters. I mean I wrote it as Crooked Heart, Old Baggage, Be for Victory. But I think you can read Crooked Heart or Old Baggage in, in either order. Chronologically it starts with old baggage. Yeah, but but I I would prefer to start. I I would advise someone to start with Crooked Heart and then move backwards and then leap forward. And did you always have this book in mind when you because no. it's the characters that sustain it? When you first started writing Noel, did you feel like you needed to kind of pick up his story again? I did when I got to the end, and that tends to happen with my books. I'm so in, I'm so infused with my characters. I want to know what happens to them next. So when I got to the end of um, Crooked Heart, I thought I would like to write a sequel. I would, because there was, you know, it's very open-ended. It ends with him old, living in a house in London. And anything could happen. And mm. I, I really, I really wanted to do that. And I wrote a treatment for it quite quickly. And it was so much in my head that one of the scenes in the treatment uh, I went more or less intact into the final book. So oh, wow. once, once you know your characters, it's easier to take them forward. And we then... Um with obviously Crooked Heart, we get kind of Noel's origin story as well, in, yes. in, a, in a way. Well, that's right. And I, I really, it was lucky, really, that when I wrote Crooked Heart, there, you don't really know, you don't know at all how Noel came to live with his godmother. Just mentioned in passing, he comes to live with her when he's four. And when, so that gave me a, quite an open-ended a way of, of writing Old Baggage, at her, which ends with Noel appearing. But what I did find is that in, in Crooked Eye, I had this character, Matty, that I was then going back to write a lot more about. And so I had to make a Bible of Matty. What had I said about Matty? Everything I said in Crooked Heart has to be set up or believable in old baggage comes before it. And it was all fine, apart from the fact that I had made her a PhD in, um, she, she had a doctorate in Crooked Heart. And that was quite difficult to work into old baggage. That was the only thing I'd slightly slightly handcuffed myself with that one you know I because it all had to be true true to the character oh well I did not notice that oh that's right <laughs> I may have been thinking there was a couple of years between me reading them but maybe if I read them oh. all, all in period um so it would be interesting what kind of what writers you, you read that, that inspire you I, I, I there's certain books that, that can be called series that I find particularly endearing like the Adrian Mole books and, and, and that kind of thing where people talk about real life in very authentic and interesting ways, but also very, very funny. Is there anyone you read at the moment you think 
That's that. Um, well, the, the historical series I've read most recently is Hilary Mantel, which I, I was certainly not to compare myself with, but um, I I absolutely loved what she did with uh, the, the way she wrote Wolf Hall. I, I avoided reading it for quite a long time, funnily enough. And then I I started reading and I thought, I think it's absolutely brilliant. It does all sorts of things I would never do. It's in the present tense. It's 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 um it's got this peculiar thing where whenever you see he in the text, it always means the the main character, even if there's another he talking. And it takes a while to get into her writing style, I suppose. What I'm saying, but it's so vivid. It's like being in the period. It's not like reading about the period. And mm. that's what I aim for. And there's there's a, another there's a a writer called uh, Sylvia Townsend Warner, who was writing in the 20s and 30s, who wrote a number of remarkable books. But one of the books she wrote was called The Corner That Held Them. And it's about um, nuns in the 13th century. I mean, you know, what an alien world. And yet it's so vivid, you feel as if you've been dropped through a skylight into that world. It's not like peering it through a telescope. It's like being in it. it it's totally immersive. You don't feel like you're reading historical fiction and I suppose that's what I aim for the, the, the writing something which means you're there with the characters you're not peering at them and that that's that's what yeah that's what I aim for and I think Sarah Waters does it you know brilliantly uh, I think her uh, I, I loved her um second world war book which, which I completely forgot the name of now the one that goes backwards have you um not the, the night watch the night watch about ambulance um, crews during the Second World War. She does it again. You're you you you're there with them. What they see, you see, and I love that. And so, without back to V for Victory, without spoiling the ending for anyone, what's next? Are we going to see a recurrence of these people? Do you feel that this has kind of finished their tale? Are you going to return to this period and these characters? I think that's that's. I finished it now. I don't. I, I was pleased with the ending and. Um, I think it's it's open ended and yet it feels like an ending, and I think I've done that. I think I've done that now. I don't think I want to write them again, but I have been thinking lately about what I am writing next and and whether I should move eras or something. And I'm but I'm reading about the immediate post war period. I think I've written about Second World War now. You know, I don't think I'm going to return there. But I'm reading about the austerity era, which is completely fascinating. So that's possibly where my next book will be set but it'll be different characters i always find those the, um as our time kind of time period moves on it's interesting to revisit these things because it's almost like the waters are kind of closing over that period gradually uh, yes, I, I, as our older generation is, is going yes yeah so i read a book a few years ago called um hans and rudolph um which is a uh, an account of um the author's uh, uncle who was a, a post-war um spy who uh, hunted down Rudolf Hess from, oh, from wow. yeah, yeah. his point about it was always that the waters are closing over this period so it's what you have to write about it now so these things can be there, there may be people who remember it who can ratify accounts and that kind of thing as well very good point although I did when I particularly when I was re writing their finest hour and a half I did talk to quite a lot of film veterans because this was very specific what I was writing about and in the end I stopped doing that because because we're all human and we all think our own experience is the only experience. Mm. And what I do find about talking to older people, I am sure I'm the same and I certainly will be the same when I'm, I'm a bit older. We, yes, our view of it is narrow. Our view of it is only our own experience. And I always remember talking to um, uh, somebody who worked on, uh, in which we serve, the, uh, the, the Noel Coward film about uh, sailors. And I said to him, did, did you ever get the studio um, without, um, you know, without a script being finished? You know, would, would you have to have rewrites in the studio floor? And he said, never. That never happened. Nobody ever went to studio without the script being finished. And I had in my possession a leaflet of a lecture given by a woman writer during the Second World War saying, too many British films are written on the back of fag packets in studio. And I thought, well, you know, <laughs> you know I have somebody who's, whose memory of it is so concrete. I can't actually rely on it because I've got something written in 1942. And so although you do get a little, you, you do get something from obviously talking to veterans, you, you cannot rely on it entirely mm. because, because our memories 
pardon. Yes. And, 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 and we, we start not acknowledging other people's experience. Yeah. So I would that, much rather have stuff written at the time. That feels like it came kind of came through in in their finest hour and a half as well. There was these kind of varying levels of incompetent men kind of in this film industry and then the, uh, this woman comes along who's exceptionally gifted and <laughs> well that's right I mean I did love writing about it I, and it was partly my tribute to to writers rooms you know I spent a lot of time on radio and telly working with writers I didn't write for radio and telly I, I produced and directed um but going into the writers room and feeling that buzz and feeling that cre creativity and hearing the banter I loved uh, I loved that atmosphere and I always wanted to write about that and, and speaking of, so for anyone watching this who doesn't know, Their Finest Hour and a Half became the film Their Finest a couple of yes. years ago. Which was, yes, which it was did. And so for these books, is there any adaptation plans? I've always seen a television series. Well, as soon as I read Crooked Heart and I, put, I was reading it on a plane, I put it down and I was like, well, I can't wait for the TV series. Oh, <laughs> God. Be well, fun. it's been bought for a film is what's happened. But, and because of that, of course, everything's ground to a halt. There yes. is a script and there is purportedly a director, but whether it actually gets made I don't know and because it's part of a series that means that the pe people who bought Crooked Heart also have first dibs on the other two which is slightly annoying but that's the way it is so Old Baggage might possibly be a TV series I don't know <sighs> no ask me again in five years James well I'm, I'm, hope <laughs> I'm hoping it will become one and um obviously with your background in TV and film, would, are you the kind of writer that would want to get involved in, in the script? Because I, I think these books have a lot of dialogue in them, but I wouldn't call them kind of dialogue heavy. As you said, that the exposition is done as exposition, the dialogue adds to it. Would you be the kind of person to get involved in that? I would love to. I'm no, I haven't ever been asked, and I've been slightly too diffident to suggest myself, I think, um, because I haven't written the script. But uh, their final hour and a half was a brilliant writer called Gabby Shappy, who, who did the adaptation. She was fantastic and I could oh she was I was so lucky she was so great and so sympathetic but since then I have found the urge to uh, su suggest myself should this happen again all I'll say is that, that that it's sometimes frustrating being at arm's length from a script <laughs> I can well imagine I think when you yes, it, it, so well finding the authenticity of the dialogue and, mm -hmm. um, yeah and I often find that if I if I've spent a day writing a funny line and then I see the script that didn't of that scene and they hadn't even used that line but invented their own funny line, it does get quite irritating sometimes, you know. I can, I can, I mean, it's never, a, it's never a problem I've had to have. However, no. I can well imagine that it would be. I know, why didn't you use my joke? You know, there, there is an element of that, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think we're, we're coming up to our, 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 right. our, 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 our I was going to say hour and a half because I've still got my mind in, in the finest. But um, I just, just want to say thank you again, Lisa, for talking to us. Uh, v for Victory is available now at our bookshop in Tring. And I really? really do hope it does very, very well for you. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Jamie. Thank you. Massive thanks to Lissa and to Jamie for that wonderful interview. FIFA Victory is available in our bookshop. Give us a call on 01442 827 653. All other purchase blurb is available in the text below this uh, video. Um, loads more author interviews to come. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you very soon.